Who are the Indo-Europeans? When people say, who are Germanic people? The assumption is that you're talking about an ethnic category. But in actual fact, Germanic really refers and has always referred to a linguistic category, although Tacitus referred to an ethnic group. When we're talking about genetics in the modern scientific sense, you can be certain that a Germanic tribe on the western side of that cultural area with Celtic tribal neighbours will have more in common with those than he does with Germanic tribe on the other end of uh, the Germanic cultural area whose neighbours were Slavic tribes, although they may have more in common with each other, the two Germanic groups, culturally. Like everyone knows, Indo-European has always, well, among linguists, referred exclusively to a linguistic group, a group of languages spoken around the world that originate in Europe and are spoken, uh, are, are, all these languages are descended from the Proto-Indo-European language, which linguists have determined was probably spoken around the Pontic Caspian steppe. Now, there is, however, uh, a reinforcement to this argument provided by genetic archaeology. By looking at the uh, remains of people who lived in this area that the linguists proposed as the homeland of the Proto-Indo-Europeans, they have looked at their DNA and they can look at whether, if this theory of Euro Indo-European expansion, which the linguists has proposed, was true, they can just look at this DNA and look at populations in other areas where Indo-European languages were spoken and developed in later times and see if they're descendants. And guess what? They are, which means the theory was right all along. A theory that emerged in the 19th century, got, rose to great prominence, then became very unfashionable after the Second World War, but has gradually come back again as genetic science has proven that the linguists were in fact correct. What exactly do we know about these people, these Proto-Indo-Europeans? Well, they didn't have any written language, the original ones that we know of, even though we know what their language was like because we can reconstruct from later languages derived from it what that language was. And you can tell a lot about a people by looking at their language. The other, now, the other way we can tell something about them is by looking at their DNA because that tells you a lot about them too. Now, in this video, I'm going to look at the, what the DNA shows us and what the language shows us and also what the cultural components of the descendant Indo-European cultures have, which we can presume are all derived from this. Together we build a picture of what these people were like. But let's start with what they look like. Here you see a chap. He comes from the Pontic Caspian steppe, belonging to an archaeological culture known as the Yamnaya. This guy as well. And this guy. These are reconstructions based on skeletons. They're pretty guesswork in terms of whether they have a beard, what haircut they had, that's all made up. But the faces, dimensions, there. Yeah, you might think they look like Romans, maybe you think some of them look like Vikings. Well, guess what? The, the population of the world now, the whole world, of all the people descended from these original Proto-Indo-Europeans, because their, their DNA is in India, their DNA is in Iran, their DNA is in Ireland and France, the ancient Greeks, the Latin people, I mean the Romans. Well, None of them have as much uh, genetic similarity to these Yamna people from the uh, uh, Pontic Caspian steppe as Northern Europeans. And that doesn't just mean Germanic people. I mean anyone from the north. It could be Norwegian, could be Lithuanian, could be English like me. All the Northern areas pretty uniformly uh, the same. Uh, well, not the, the same, but they all have uh, descent from these guys. And so we can guess that they probably looked a little bit like us Northern Europeans too. This year, there will be some studies which will show exactly how much the relationship between the, or how, much, how genetically similar ancient Greeks were to these people compared to modern Greeks. And we'll know some controversial facts about that. And to be honest, every time anyone talks about anything to do with Proto-Europeans, it's controversial because everyone wants to believe that they're the cultural inheritors of this, um, of this ancient people, because whether you're a Hindu or a Greek, they see this as you know, being their heritage. And the idea that this came from a foreign person, 
quite offensive to their national sensibilities. However, genetic science does not lie. So, now we got that out the way. This is the landscape of the Pontic Caspian area that they lived in. This is what it looked like. Now you can see it's grassland, just flat grassland, perfect for transportation, right? And that's why we have many words in Proto-Indo-European that are relating to transport. See them? All of them, axle, wheel, horses. Well, it shows what kind of people they were, they were chariot based. Very Indo-European to have that. And that is also reflected in later Indo-European cultures, whether it's the Romans who loved their chariots in Hinduism, or how about this Hittite chariot? Uh, it's all there. It all comes from these people. The wheel was probably invented, mm, well, it's widely believed in Mesopotamia, but actually the oldest wheel that we found is from another culture. And that culture was bordered, it's very uh, prehistoric, was the, it's bordering the steppe. So probably the steppe peoples, the Proto-Indo-European speakers, moved down into the steppe, found this wheel and used it with their horse, uh, the horses they'd already uh, tamed. And it was, uh, you know, the rest is history. They spread out very fast, but they're a warlike people. How do we know they're a warlike people? Look at all these words for war and battle. Hmm? And what else do we know about them? Well, they believed in the patriarchy. They were patriarchal. We can tell that women uh, were married into a male family, just like in the West now, we have that same tradition. And this kind of words like uh, daughter-in-law, well, we know that uh, that means that they had that same system. Uh, and also from the, 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 the general words for their society, we can tell how it was ordered and structured. It was hierarchical with male chieftains. And uh, this is also reflected in their religion. To think about their social organization, we can look at some words and understand that too. Brew means to brew, as in alcohol. Helut means beer. Wihon means wine. Geisel is a prisoner. Gosti is a guest. From this already we know that they have notions of hospitality, that they drink alcohol, that they prepare alcohol, that they have the means to the infrastructure that people can be devoted to making and brewing alcoholic drinks, and that they brew an excess of this that they can prepare for guests, but also that they hold people prisoners, and that they don't just kill all their enemies on sight. We can tell all that just from words. There's guas, cattle, and cattle were important in the religion as well. There's two uh, different roles of cattle in the creation story that's been reconstructed. I'll get to that in a moment. Hoitos to, uh, is an oath. Clearly they had notions of oaths, just as we see in later in the European cultures, such as the Norse. Spurd is a contest or race. So they had sporting contests. Koine means revenge or punishment. For these two things seem to be connected. This this kind of thing is all stuff that we think of almost like our society. Well, maybe we can tell a little bit about their notions of race and belonging from their words. Wake means to settle or settlement or tribe. It's the tribe. Tute, that means tribe as well. And it's related to the word Teuton, which means one's own people in Germanic languages, in the ancient Germanic languages. Wake potis is the chieftain the head of the wake, the set the tribe. So clearly the leader is associated with the tribe. His ability to lead is associated with that, just as the word king comes from kuning and kun, which means kin. So there's a connection in, in, in the European sense between leadership and the tribe, the people, the ethnos. There's also the word herios, and that means kinsman. And it's from this word that the indo aranic languages, which derive from Proto-European at a later date, derive their word Aryan, which is what the in 19th century historians used to refer to the Proto-Indo-Europeans as the Aryans. And uh, some, even in the 20th century, that word Aryan had even been extended to mean any descendant of any Indo-European culture. Uh, nowadays, it's mostly used to refer exclusively to the descendants of the 
uh, Proto-Indo-Europeans who moved eastward to become the Indo-Iranic peoples or Indo-Aryan peoples because the word Aryan itself is Indo-Iranic. However, as I've just said, Herios is the Indo-European root and there may be other cognates in Western Indo-European languages as well. The Indo-Europeans, the, the Yamnaya themselves were a combination of two groups. Uh, they were partially from the Eastern hunter-gatherers who came from Northern Russia kind of area, uh, who had been a stocky breed, broad brachycephalic, I think is the term, uh, mammoth hunters, basically. They'd been hunting mammoths on the steppe and as a result, they'd become quite robust. And they mixed with the hunter-gatherers of the Caucasus. Um, and um, as a result, uh, created a, a, because the Caucasus hunter-gatherers were somewhat more gracile in appearance, therefore the uh, Yamnaya were intermediary. If you were thinking what the original um, Eastern hunter-gatherers looked like, you could think of some, maybe some stocky Cockney football hooligan or some Polish builder, and you're somewhere on the right track. Um, whereas uh, the Yamnaya were somewhat perhaps more average Northern European looking. The Yamna then moved into Western Europe, where they blended with the, the existing populations, who were a combination of the Western hunter-gatherer groups and the East uh, and the Neolithic farmers. When they blended, they became the corded ware culture, and uh, we can see when we do DNA tests on corded ware culture that there is a, a, a step ancestry component. Um, and this corded ware culture went up into Scandinavia and became the uh, boat axe culture, which then gave birth to the Nordic Bronze Age. Corded ware culture starts around four or five thousand years ago, and uh, and then from there, in the European languages diversify. We get all of them: Celtic languages, Latin languages, Germanic languages come uh, more recently. Distinct pagan religions uh, also emerge and separated from one another. The success of the Indo-European culture and its it spread is down mainly to their horses and chariots. And uh, then some kind of event happened that led to, in many cases across Europe, their breeding bias events so that the male lineage, the, uh, the R1B and R1A haplogroups spread a lot. So the women were being taken, but the Indo-Europeans generally were exogamous, so they took women from other tribes, which meant they blended with other peoples as they went around. Another reason they might have become more dominant could have been just that they carried diseases with them that helped to wipe out the uh, other populations. But whether or not that's true, don't know. But this year, there was a very interesting paper which came from um, Berens, Cooper and Lachance. And it, it proposes that the proto-Aryans who went eastward, they enjoyed superior health to their contemporaries. Um, it says that they had extremely healthy genomes, especially for cancers and immune-related periodontal and gastrointestinal diseases. And that this could certainly have given them an advantage at that time. So now we're familiar with them, I think it's time to move towards the religion. They had two notions of the sacred. One was associated with the high, the, you know, the godlike, and the other was a taboo notion of sacred. I can say that there was a very prominent bear cult of some sort among the Proto-Indo-Europeans and this uh, led to the word for bear being avoided, they wouldn't even say it. And this must have continued in other Indo-European religions for thousands of years because the other Indo-European languages have the same custom. So the word that we use for bear in English, bear, and the, the Nordic word Bjorn, both of these are kind of euphemistic or kennings, meaning the brown one. They won't say the real word for him. And in Russian, the word for bear is medved, which means the honey eater. 
the actual word for um, bear in these languages uh, is not always preserved, but the Proto-Indo-European word, we know it from the one where it has been preserved, and it would be erkto. No bear's gonna show up? Oh, bloody hell! <laughs> no, um, the, uh, the, the word erkto is the uh, root of Greek Arctos, like the publishing company, and the Latin Ursus, uh, like the constellation in the sky. So clearly bears were very revered because they thought that even saying that word could cause them to you summon them upon you. And I think that means that they probably respected the boundaries. They were living in close proximity to wild animals like wolves and bears, and they respected them, and they didn't want to infringe upon their um, sort of territories to some extent. Maybe I'm referring too much here, but I get the impression that it shows a mutual respect for this creature. And um, certainly, whatever the details of this cult are, we don't really know, but we know that bears are important. Not important enough to be in the uh, creation myth, though. In the uh, Indo-European creation myth, which was reconstructed by Professor David Anthony, and I also mentioned it in a previous video on, in, on chariots and boats and stuff, um, it's basically, it starts off with two twins. Um, Mano and Yamo, and they uh, go with a cow to the Sky Father, the ultimate god, the best god of all, Peter Dias, the Sky Father. It just means that. Uh, he's, he's the uh, same as Zeus or Jupiter, or um, originally Tyr in the Norse pantheon, but uh, I suppose his roles got taken on by Odin, as I said in my video on Odin. Uh, also, probably a bit by Thor, because this is a sky god, and Thor is the sky god in Norse mythology, but originally it would be a Tyr, or Tyu in Anglo-Saxon. Anyway, so they sacrifice this cow, um, and uh, that cow sacrifice is uh, mirrored in the Mithraic rituals of Rome and Persia. And Peter Dias then creates the world with these offerings. Um, and the man called Manu becomes then the first priest, and he establishes through this action the right of sacrifice, the relation between man and God. A bit like also what I was saying about the role of Odin, the, the, the mediator between man and God is the priest, a divine priest. And Manu as well is the laws of Manu you have in Hinduism, which is referring to the same thing, uh, same man, Manu, the first man, the first priest. Then in the myth, a third man comes and he is called Trito, uh, and he is given the gift of cattle by Peter Dias. and um, the but the cattle is stolen by a three-headed serpent or dragon and Trito in in a quest then becomes the first warrior it's kind of like the birth of the Kshatriya caste uh, and he goes on his quest to reclaim the cattle and to ensure the reciprocal cycle of giving between man and God because the cattle are sacrificed to man and uh, sacrificed to God, and Peter Dias gives to man cattle, and they're taken away by the third element. And this cycle of uh, giving and taking between man and God and in sacrifice, this is seen in many Indo-European religions as well. It goes along with the Hindu notion of the cycles, of everything goes in cycles. So it's about giving um, and receiving. Other gods exist as well, we know that all other gods, but they were probably quite uh, trivial in comparison. Among them is um, Heosus, the goddess of the dawn, uh, Sehul and Mehnot, the goddess of the sun and the moon respectively, the god of the moon. Let me explain that although in Hinduism and in Greek religion the sun is the male deity and the moon is the female, in Norse, Anglo-Saxon, Baltic, and most other Indo-European religions, it's the other way around. And in the Proto-Indo-European way, it was the moon that was male and the sun that was female. And in fact, the sun goddess is seen in some way as being merely the eye of the Sky Father. That's an interesting concept. The Sky Father is the ultimate god. Now, I think you've gotten a good idea about who the Indo-Europeans are and what they look like and where they came from. And this year, there's going to be all kinds of amazing uh, research done in DNA evidence about uh, who they are. And you can see your relation to them just by, even with existing evidence, by taking it, if you've got a DNA sample, then you can run it through um, GEDmatch, G-E-D-M-A-T-C-H, the website. 
and uh, check it against uh, Eurogene's uh, uh, data. Anyway, thanks for listening. If you want to read more on this subject, then check out some of the links I've put in the description. Uh, if you only read one, make sure it's the one on the screen now by Hark et al. And in the spirit of the Indo-European reciprocal cycle of giving and receiving, having watched this video, why don't you become a patron or send me a donation? The links for Patreon and PayPal are also in the description. Thanks.